Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. You're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of media outlet, be it a PBS station, community access television, or perhaps a university or an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you like our shows, and you want to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're going to be taking a look at a very volatile area of the world, and that's a small part, but a major part of the Middle East, and look at what is developing with, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. My guest today is an expert on this topic. My guest today is Dr. Michael Cairo. Dr. Cairo is an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and a Professor of Political Science at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. Dr. Cairo, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's uh, good to be here. Yes, we haven't done this for a couple of years. I think it's been two years since we've had this conversation. Exactly. And the way events change so quickly mm -hmm. in the Middle East, we could do it every two days. <laughs> we could. At least, right. We could, although uh, things change, but things stay the same. Uh, very true. Ways, and, and, and a lot of patterns and themes emerge it's, that are Exactly. That's a great entree, Mike. Why don't we go into it? What, as an expert on this area and in this area, what do you see as some of the patterns, some of the themes, and the, sort of the lay of the land, a little update on mm -hmm. the current situation, even though that will change tomorrow or the next day? But how do you see it right now? Well, Israel and Palestine, uh, not much has changed in many ways. I mean, the peace process is stalled. Mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't look like there's going to be any movement on that peace process in the, in the future. The administration has continually said they're going to release a, a peace plan, but uh, they've never made any movement on a peace plan uh, thus far. You've got uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran as regional powers that are uh, vying for control in places like Yemen and Syria, um, and, and the conflict remains there. Uh, in 2016, there was uh, much talk about how things might change with a new administration, but, but very little has changed. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we're pretty much on the same path in, in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, for years and years, we've heard how the United States wants to be a sort of a neutral broker, if mm -hmm. you will, uh, sort of a mediator to some degree in that area. What The United States today is not viewed that way, is it? It's, no, It has not changed at all. completely. Why, why is that? Uh, well, a lot of it has to do with Trump's decision on Israel and moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, frankly, that decision removes the United States as a neutral broker in the process because it, even, even if you accept the fact that, yes, Israel was controlling Jerusalem, uh, the United States making it legalized in a sense or legitimized mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, creates a problem for the United States as, as a neutral broker. Now, Iran has become the major power pointing out the fact that the United States cannot be a neutral broker in this. Saudi Arabia and Israel have gotten closer relations uh, more recently because of their opposition to Iran and concerns about what we might call a, a cold war in the Middle East, where Iran and Saudi Arabia are battling not for control of hearts in terms of the Shia-Sunni battle, but more for control of the regional power sphere. You see that in Yemen with Iran backing the Houthi and the Saudis backing the, the government and the Saudi intervention there. You saw that in Syria with Iran supporting Bashar al-Assad, the Saudis uh, less so. In fact, the Saudis were supporting uh, ISIS and factions of, of uh, uh, terrorist groups in Syria as a part of that. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with the regional power balance uh, of what's going on. But when Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, I would argue it actually made Israel less secure rather than more secure. Iran increased its support of Hamas in the process. Uh, Iran also uh, and Hamas increased their actions against Israel uh, with support to Hezbollah, uh, Iran as well. So, so it, it doesn't make Israel more secure. It makes Israel less secure. You've seen that with actions between Gaza and Israel most recently. Mm -hmm. And many of the foreign policy 
experts who view that area of the world, watch that area of the world, indicated that it really, if you're going to do something, you should get something in return. And yes. if you were going to move the embassy, you should get something in return. And President Trump apparently got nothing in return. Or if well, he did, his, we, his, we don't know what that is. His argument was that this would put pressure on the uh, Palestinians, mm -hmm. knowing that Jerusalem's off the table, so let's deal on something else. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that Jerusalem's the center of this conflict. Jerusalem mm -hmm. isn't just about religion. It's about place, who controls the place, who has access to the place. Um, as important issue for both the Palestinians and the Israelis. And neither side is ready to come to the table. I mean, Netanyahu, uh, as the Israeli prime minister, has a cabinet that is diverse for the right. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a lot of extreme right-wing parties that he has mm -hmm. to maintain support of, and so he can't really broker a deal with the Palestinians, even if he wanted to. Uh, of course, Netanyahu comes out of a more militant Zionist perspective. His mm -hmm. father was a follower of Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was a militant Zionist in the 1920s and 1930s, um, who wanted to really see the West Bank and other areas as part of a greater Israel. For mm -hmm. Abbas on the Palestinian side, he has a similar problem. He has to his flank Hamas. You've got Fatah and Hamas. And if he brokers anything that looks too moderate or too opening to the Israelis and the United States now, because they're linked with this move of the embassy to Jerusalem, it's nearly impossible to get the full support because Hamas will call him a traitor. So you've got sort of a, a delicate balancing act by both individuals. And while they might rhetorically talk about peace, there, there really isn't any peace on the horizon or mm -hmm. any kind of negotiations that either will pursue. Mm -hmm. For several years, as I recall, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu indicated that he wanted a two-state solution, mm -hmm. a Palestinian state and an Israeli state living yes. side by side, peaceful coexistence, and they could get along and <laughs> move forward together into the future. Mm -hmm. But recently, he seems to be taking the stance that he would rather have a single state. Mm -hmm. What is the advantage between a one-state solution versus two-state solution? And can a one-state solution actually survive in that area of the world without it becoming an apartheid state? Well, what I tell you is that what you essentially have is a one-state solution. Right now. Israel has made facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they have, through the use of settlements and other policies, essentially cut up the West Bank in such a way that a two-state solution is nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. um, the advantages of a two-state solution, of course, would be that the Palestinians would have some autonomy. Except the two-state solution that Netanyahu is talking about is not a, a two-state solution where the Palestinians would have full sovereignty. Uh, Netanyahu always saw a role for Israel in the state that would be created as, as part of that Palestinian entity. In addition, the Palestinians want Jerusalem to be their capital, particularly East Jerusalem, and that is never going to happen in that two-state solution. So a lot of that, I think, is more rhetorical, uh, political, much as was Trump's decision on Jerusalem. I mean, what did Trump get out of it? You asked earlier. What he got out of it was a, a political adoration from certain elements of the Jewish community in the United States, people like David Friedman, who's the ambassador to Israel, who is a far right mm -hmm. and who has supported settlements all along. He gets the adoration of Netanyahu uh, in the region as an important ally. But uh, that's about all he gets in that process. So. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point. You mentioned how the, the settlements, mm -hmm. which are viewed primarily by the international community, by the UN Security Council, uh, the majority of them are illegal settlements mm -hmm. and occupied territories, right. what they're labeled at. But you might mention a little bit about the situation there of how these settlements have broken up the territory sure. that used to be Palestinian territory, mm -hmm. and then tie that into Gaza. When we're talking about autonomy, what type of autonomy actually exists between yeah. the Palestinian Authority, the people who are near the settlements, mm -hmm. and people who live in Gaza? Of course, the West Bank and Gaza are separated, and one of the mm -hmm. big stumbling points or mm -hmm. obstacles to any peace process is, would there be any way for those two places to connect? Would there be a road that they could travel on to get from one to the other? Gaza is essentially walled off. It is embargoed uh, both from the sea and from Israeli territory. Israel controls everything going in and out. Mm -hmm. And when there are particular security concerns, Israel uses those security concerns justifiably in some cases 
to close off Gaza. In terms of the West Bank, you asked about, about how settlements cut up the area. If you look at a map of settlements, uh, there are pockets all throughout the West Bank that are either surrounding Palestinians or encroaching into further Palestinian land. Hebron, for example, a very contentious area, um, uh, the home of the patriarchs, uh, religiously. And you've got the Israeli settlers essentially surrounding Palestinians there. You have Ramallah in the north with settlements around it, and Ramallah being the Palestinian Authority's capital. A lot of people don't know this, but Ramallah and Jerusalem are not that far apart. You could drive there in a straight line, probably 30 minutes, except you can't go through a straight line. You have to go all the way around through Bethlehem, in many cases, which is in the south, to get into Jerusalem. So if I work in Jerusalem and I'm a Palestinian and I drive from Ramallah, it could take up to five hours, especially if you add checkpoints. And yet you're talking about a place that's 30 miles, 40 miles away at most. <laughs> um, uh, that adds to this. So that's part of the problem. But even if you create a Palestinian state, that Palestinian state has no access to the sea. All of its trade would either have to go through Jordan or Israel as, as a part of uh, any kind of movement mm -hmm. and getting any kind of economic uh, uh, mm -hmm. interdependence and independence. Mm -hmm. As you look at the situation, it's a very challenging situation, mm -hmm. to put it mildly. Yeah. What, what recommendations would you make as far as how they could move forward with a peace proposal? Now, admittedly, the Palestinians, since we moved the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, they don't want to even speak to the United States right. at this point. We'll not even communicate. Right. That would have been my first recommendation. Don't it's, do it's that. Move it back. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Right. <laughs> So that's done. <laughs> that's done. So that kind right. of, uh, Chris, of course, that's not a, mm. not a done that an well, it, next it administration could reverse. Back. Sure, exactly. Um, certainly. Mm. Uh, I think a, a big step in this needs to be a, a ceasefire that both sides accept continually, not a ceasefire that's accepted every sporadically mm. and then we'll shoot some more missiles from Gaza. Oh, we'll. Um, do some more sorties into Gaza from the Israeli side. And that's actually pretty difficult because both sides see it as a security and survival issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israelis certainly see it as a security issue, and you can understand that. If missiles can reach Tel Aviv or Haifa, um, pretty far up the coast from Gaza, that's a security issue, and I understand that as a security issue. But it's also a security issue when you have the area walled off uh, a human security issue when people can't get medical supplies, food, other things that create the kind of desperation that leads to a lot of the conflict that we have now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there are other things that could have, well, we're talking about the United States being, yeah. no longer being viewed as a neutral broker. That, that myth has been shattered. Yeah, and this is part of the point. problem. I mean, who comes in now? The European mm -hmm. Union for years is sort of a, a, mm -hmm. a neutral broker. But within the European Union, you have disagreements about whether the Palestinians or the Israelis uh, should be more prominent or, or, or have, exactly. uh, have an advantage. So the European <laughs> Union doesn't necessarily have a good place to come at this from. And because they have so many different interests, Russia mm -hmm. certainly isn't a neutral broker no, far in from the process, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Move them so, out. <laughs> so China is not really a neutral broker in the process. Right. You, you pretty much don't have a neutral broker now. That's mm -hmm. the real problem with what the Trump administration did. They removed any element, even if that element was more about perception. I, mm -hmm. I mean, most people would argue that the United States has always been more on the side of Israel than the Palestinians. Uh, you know, historically, you're not going to, to get an argument from me about that. True. But when you take it to the level of moving the embassy, you've removed the United States from any semblance of being able to broker peace. You remove the Camp David type things that happened with Carter or the Oslo type things that happened through back channels and that Clinton supported. Um, it, it just becomes a non-starter. Mm -hmm. exactly. in the process. And without the United States there, if you look historically, there hasn't really been a peace process. Mm -hmm. It's been the U.S., the U.N., yes, but with the support of the U.S. Mm -hmm. exactly. And now the U.S. isn't really playing the role of peace process. They're playing the role of uh, advocate for Israel mm -hmm. um, as part of this. Exactly. 
And as you look at the situation too, there, there are many things that have been done over the past year or two. Mm -hmm. One that comes to mind is that we have the, uh, the situation where the United States defunded mm -hmm. the Palestinian Authority. Absolutely. We were putting in like, I think 200, was it into 250 million into, it was about, yeah. roughly into that, and now we're not donating no. anything, is that correct? What, yeah, what's yeah. the long-term effect of that? Well, it's, it's a long-term <laughs> effect on human development for the people mm -hmm. in the region. Um, a lot of that was going to things such as aid for medical and food and other kinds of supplies. Mm -hmm. um, without that, and with that kind of funding cut off, it makes it more difficult for the Palestinian Authority to provide services for its people. And it explains a lot of the desperation and anger mm -hmm. on the part of Palestinians as well. The Palestinian Authority um, in a way, it has failed too. I mean, Mahmoud Abbas has not been able to get a government together that can do what a government needs to do. Of course, he has a lot more obstacles than many other governments do, but but it has failed as well in this process. Mm -hmm. so. Right, and of course, a lot of that funding, I think that went through the UN, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, which has really been the backbone of providing health services, mm -hmm. educational services, other types of services yep. to the Palestinians, and they were set up on a short-term basis, I think in 1948. They were, way back they've been then, there and ever, they've ever been there since. ever since because the situation is so dire. So, And, and because of the issues related to refugee and, and uh, uh, right of return. Right, exactly. That rose up and that uh, the United Nations has been a strong supporter of the idea of the right of return, the idea that mm -hmm. Palestinians could return to their homes in Israel. Well this they are considered still refugees. Now, one of the big questions is, how far down the generational line do you go to consider someone a refugee? Mm -hmm. um, but without this aid, it is, it is a significant uh, hit to the Palestinian services and human development. Mm -hmm. And with the Palestinians, if, if it is a one-state solution, which mm -hmm. it is right now, basically, yeah. at what point do you say we're going to give voting rights to the people who are in this one state, be it mm -hmm. Arabs, Palestinians, whatever, uh, anybody this, who's there who's eligible? When, when will that happen? And if that does happen, will the Israelis not be outnumbered? That's the concern. That's been Israel's concern all along. You can't have a Jewish state without a Jewish majority. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why Ariel Sharon unilaterally gave up Gaza. Gaza has two million people. When you have that many people and you start thinking about what might happen to the state if they're added in with birth rates higher than the Israeli birth rates, uh, the Israelis feel demographically in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the same can be said for the West Bank. This has happened in, in East Jerusalem. You know, the Israelis have moved more and more into East Jerusalem, but even with all that movement in East Jerusalem, they've never had more than about 60% uh, majority population, mm -hmm. which suggests that they could lose that. And that's sort of the viewpoint that many Israelis have. So the idea of extending the vote or extending citizenship is a very contentious idea mm -hmm. in Israel. It certainly is. And I, I would suggest to you that it's not likely to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Well, there's so many, so many issues that come yeah. into play, and I hope we have time to get into two more. One is with Iran. Yeah. The United States in 2003 invaded Iraq. We basically made Iran the key player in that yes, area of the absolutely. world. We put Iran in the driver's seat, inadvertently, yeah. but it happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people predicted that was going to happen. We saw, in, I guess it was 2015, the United Nations, the permanent five members of the UN, right. uh, who are on the 15-member Security Council, and Germany, plus the EU and a couple the others EU were involved, in essence, yeah. but they, they cracked a deal with Iran to had one goal, to make sure Iran did not develop a nuclear weapon. Right. That agreement held until just a couple of months ago when President Trump right. pulled us out of that. What is the significance of that, and what does the future hold for Iran developing a nuclear weapon, which would be absolutely devastating for right. Israel and everybody in that area of the world? Right. I mean, uh, I, I think the Trump administration sort of hurt themselves more than helped themselves in this. Um, a lot of the other countries are trying to hold that deal together still. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that our, the message that we sent to Iran by pulling out of that deal is that Iran is our enemy. If the message you send is you are our enemy, uh, 
the result on the other side is that Iran says, well, what's to stop me from making sure I can create a deterrent so that you can't attack me directly? So I actually would argue that it's sped up the process for Iran getting a nuclear weapon rather than slowed it down. Moreover, that creates more conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran because the Saudis are very concerned about this as well. So I think in the process, containing Iran was a better plan, containing them through diplomatic agreements, than it was uh, confronting exactly. them. And they were abiding by the, the agreement. By all measures. That by we all can, measures. The yeah. UN International Atomic Energy Agency had mm -hmm. monitored what they were doing, and they were actually complying with what they said right. they were going to do. And, and there's a great deal of irony. You know, uh, Trump reaches out to North Korea, legitimizes the North Korean dictator, and they're not abiding by anything oh, no. they've said. Exactly. And yet, and yet you know, uh, That's he's right. not uh, willing to And after with the Iran. Singapore summit with President Trump and Kim Jong Un, mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un won. He yes. walked away with everything, and we got yes. nothing in return, and they've actually ramped up their program. Absolutely. So we're dealing with that. We'll have to come back and talk yeah, about yeah. that later. Uh, one other factor that's playing into all this was the killing, a horrible, horrible killing mm -hmm. of a Washington Post journalist, a Saudi citizen, uh, Khashoggi. Right. What, what is the, the status of that right now, and how does that play into the Saudi Arabia, Iranian, Israeli-Palestinian-U.S. Well, relationship. The United States government right now mm -hmm. would argue, the Trump administration would argue, that this is, this is about interest. And, you know, you're not going to break relations with Saudi Arabia over this because of oil. Uh, I like to keep in mind that we have 11 percent of oil coming from Saudi Arabia, 40 percent from Canada. It hasn't stopped us from causing trouble with Canada recently. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's their argument. I think there's a personal part to this, too. Uh, Jared Kushner has uh, become close with the Crown Trump's Prince. Trump's son-in-law. Trump's son-in-law. Right. And um, there, there are some economic interests, I think, with the Trumps and Saudi Arabia, certainly. But uh, the bigger issue is, is that for years we've been wondering whether our relationship with Saudi Arabia is paying off or not. Remember 9-11, most of the terrorists were Saudis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Barack Obama had started to move us away from Saudi Arabia. It actually upset the Saudis, especially when we made the Iran deal. Trump is getting back into that circle. Um, so it's, it's a, a complicated relationship, especially when you bring in the human rights issues that are, that are going on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they're even talking now about the United States supplying nuclear fissionable material mm -hmm. to Saudi Arabia. Yes. How solid an idea is that? Well, if you compare it to something yep. like India and Pakistan, right. uh, it, it only creates a, a potential powder keg. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Iran, Israel doesn't admit it, but we know they have nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, Iran is on its way. Uh, adding nuclear weapons to Saudi Arabia, especially with what you see going on in Yemen, what we've seen happen in Syria, um, the issue of having an accident or a limited if you can have a limited nuclear strike, uh, it rises uh, mm -hmm. in the conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's have a uh, hypothetical situation yeah. here. Saudi Arabia still does not have the ability to create right. a nuclear weapon, but they're talking about doing it, mm -hmm. and the U.S. government's talking about helping them do mm -hmm. it. But that would certainly goad Iran into, into developing a nuclear weapon absolutely. immediately because Iran and Saudi Arabia are, are bitter enemies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's no question about that, uh, I, I think. Yeah. So we, we should look at that very, very closely. It should be, yeah. It's, it's, it's a dangerous situation it's, if you start adding nuclear weapons to the mix. In it, the it certainly is, yeah. And, and we really, what do we have, nine nuclear powers right now, I think? That's about, yeah. something like Something like that. And we really don't need to be adding to these nuclear powers because it just creates instability. And mm -hmm. people do not trust when, when adversaries such as India and Pakistan do not trust one another. Mm -hmm. Who knows what can happen? And that, that is one area that's an extremely volatile area of the world, especially right. if the Pakistani government were to fall or the, the terrorists were to get a hold of the nuclear right. weapons, and it could be absolutely devastating. But and you have the same thing with Saudi Arabia. A lot of people don't want to think about it, but the Saudis' uh, connection to Wahhabism, that's right, uh, fundamental Islam that has connections to groups like Al Qaeda and mm -hmm. other groups that have arisen. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if the Saudi government were to fall and a lot of their legitimacy is questioned by their people mm -hmm. and you have nuclear weapons there, is that in America's interest? That's very, very true. Well, Mike, 
Dr. Michael Cairo, this is an extremely volatile area of the world. Yes. It's one we need to monitor. We need to have the United Nations agencies involved, which they are, right. trying to help bring they peace to this area But of the without world. the U.S. supporting them, exactly. it's much more difficult. You've got to have the U.S. Yeah. But I want to thank you so very much for a Great. very interesting and a As very always, informative Bill, program. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.